Welcome back. It's Intro to Physical Anthropology. I'm your instructor, David Leitner. Today, we are going to talk about, uh, as it says right here on the screen, hominin evolution in the late Pleistocene. Uh, hominin evolution during this time period, during the late Pleistocene. So we're talking about the period Homo erectus has already left Africa. Um, it's been in Europe and Asia for quite a while, and some changes have started occurring. Well, that's the time period we're talking about. It's sort of as these changes occur, what is happening in evolution? So we'll take a look at that today. Uh, with that, let's get started. Okay, so just to give you a picture of what how what a wide range uh, we're talking about here. Um, we have these are sites for archaic Homo sapiens. So these are the sort of transitional forms between uh, late Homo erectus in each of these regions, and then the regional species that will come about: Neanderthals in Europe, Denisovans in Asia, and Homo sapiens in Africa. That uh, that should give you an idea of sort of how widespread things are. Remember, up until Homo erectus, we were just focusing on little parts of Africa. Now we've got these sites all over the place. Now, it's important to remind ourselves that it is not, we don't have a direct lineage that we can sort of point to to say this little population right here is what turned into Homo sapiens, and this little population right here turned into uh, Denisovans or Neanderthals, etc. Um, uh, and similarly, we don't have any way of saying, you know, well, what, what, what was the exact population or way exactly did these archaic transitional forms come about? Um, there are a lot of reasons for this. The usual, you know, the fossil record is necessarily incomplete and not a random sampling of the past. Um, and, of course, there are lots of taxonomic disputes. How many archaic Homo sapiens species are there? Should we be talking about them as different species? I've mentioned before there's some debate about whether some of the archaic Homo sapiens found in Europe should be called antecessor. Homo antecessor, or whether they should still just sort of be lumped in this larger group of archaic Homo sapiens. Um, you know, the issue of what is normal variation versus what constitutes a new species is always there. Uh, Neanderthals, you know, pose a problem for us. Uh, we now know that they interbred with homo, early Homo sapiens, so uh, in Europe... Uh, so what uh, what does that mean? We've always thought of them as a different species, but does that make them a subspecies of Homo sapiens? Well, they have different origins, as we'll see. So there are a lot of debates that we have to get into, um, uh, including sort of, you know, why did some of these populations survive and others didn't? Now, to give you a sort of lumper splitter view here, the splitter view, remember, wants to sort of, wants nice, uh, wants lots of lots of species or categories. They tend to look at every change as potentially a new species. Uh, whereas the lumper view is more conservative and says, uh, that's not as clear. In this case, usually that means the lumper view is a lot more, a lot simpler. In this case, it's the opposite. You know, if we took the splitter view where we just have Homo erectus leaving and then turning into various species of Homo heidelbergensis and then later Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, etc., uh, that would be fine. They don't list Denisovans on this chart. This was made just a few years. The, the, the discovery of Denisovans is relatively recent, so it hasn't made it into all of the textbooks yet. Um, but uh, the Lumper view says, actually, you've got archaic Homo sapiens, sure, but then you've got these regional variations that show up that are feeding back into each other through something called introgression, which we've referred to as genetic drift. It's just the idea that genetic material is traveling between populations. 
<clears throat> constantly. So you'll have these period periods of separation and then uh, the resumption of gene flow over and over again. And so you will get these sort of related but slightly different versions of Archaic Homo sapiens because of this. And through that same process, eventually you will get Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, and Denisovans. You'll get these separate species as a result. Now, <clears throat> what's in a name? Uh, why call these Archaic Homo sapiens? It's not a species term. We, we, we need to keep that in mind. This is not a species term. It's just a descriptor. Um, so should we be calling these Archaic Homo sapiens, or should we be calling them Advanced Homo erectus? Uh, they are significantly different from Homo erectus, but they still have a lot of Homo erectus traits. Um, they are certainly transitional, uh, but they're not just transitional between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens, transitional between Homo erectus and Neanderthals and Homo erectus and Denisovans. So why do we call them that? Well, to be honest, a lot of people, I think, are arguing that we should start talking about them as advanced Homo erectus or late grade Homo erectus, various terms like that. Um, these are not necessarily all the same species. These are not necessarily all direct descendants of Homo erectus uh, in, in a sort of nice linear fashion. What we've got, and of course not all of them are direct ancestors of anatomically modern humans, um, we've got lots of different lineages out there. Um, regional variations are important here. Um, it probably means that the features, not just for AMHs, that's anatomically modern humans, uh, but also the features for Neanderthals and the features for Denisovans probably didn't necessarily all develop in one single lineage, but probably was a result of this, what's sometimes described as a braided stream of evolution, where you have separation and the the cessation, the ending of gene flow, and then it's beginning again, and ending and beginning. And by this way, you get different features appearing in certain populations that then get transmitted to other populations that combine with their features and so forth. And so you have this sort of constant back and forth going on. Uh, the important thing to know is that all of these transitional forms are living side by side with Homo erectus at the same time, at least in Asia for much of this time. Um, <clears throat> not quite so late in Africa and Europe, but in Asia you've got, you've got both um, groups of hominins grow living. Okay, so what makes Archaic Homo sapiens different from Homo erectus? Uh, one of the first things to note is, frankly, the brain capacity. Remember, Homo erectus, the average brain capacity comes in around 900, and they top off around 1100 or so, maybe 1200. Well, Archaic Homo sapiens go from 1000 to 1400. 1350 is the modern I mean, today, modern uh, human average grain, cranial capacity. So that puts them within the range of modern humans at this point in terms of straight cranial capacity. Uh, that is brain volume. Uh, it also puts them pretty close to the same level of encephalization, so brain to body size. Um, the skull shapes compared to Homo erectus are taller. You notice that sort of by comparing these two right here. There's much more of a forehead on this one than there is on this one. So the Archaic Homo has more of a forehead, has a taller cranial vault. It's also got more of, as we'll see in a minute, more of a parallel-sided cranial vault rather than an angled in. Um, and it's not quite as angular in the back here, as you can see. It's got more rounding at the top. Uh, the brow ridges are still prominent, but now they are arching rather than being a, bo a bar, uh, like they are in Homo erectus. And uh, finally, they have much wider nasal passages. Now, 
in terms of differences from anatomically modern humans, well, anatomically modern humans take this trend in brain growth and globularization that is the sort of spherical shape of the of the skull, the dome shape of the skull, even further. So the archaic Homo sapiens have larger faces, they have thicker walled and lower cranial vaults compared to anatomically modern humans, uh, and very importantly, anatomically modern humans have completely lost or mostly lost their brow ridges. Uh, those are the biggest changes that we see. Uh, so, in other words, the shape and size of the cranial vault, as well as the brow ridges and the face size. Now, this is basically just to illustrate that these archaic Homo sapiens, I, I'm probably beating a dead horse here, but archaic Homo sapiens are not a species in and of themselves. They are a transitional form between these two groups of hominins. Uh, they don't, it's not uh, like a direct lineage necessarily, but it's, think of it like several experiments in becoming human, uh, coming together at various points. Um, we're going to go on to look at what some of these regional variations are like uh, in the next film, but video. But uh, um, for now, just uh, bear this in mind, that we've got a landscape for a few hundred thousand years where we've got Homo erectus, various forms of archaic Homo sapiens, and then eventually even... Uh, Homo sapiens themselves, Neanderthals, and Denisovans, all living side by side for a brief period of time there in history. This is a very different world than we live in, in terms of the people that live in it, right? Uh, there is a much broader kind of humanity uh, going on here, and it's important to sort of keep that in mind about what the landscape looks like, what our, our social landscape, as much as the ecological landscape, looks like at this time. Okay, with that said, take care of yourself, have a great week, and I will see you very soon. Bye-bye.